Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. This episode is the third episode in our six part series on our investment property analysis course. So this one is gonna discuss calculating and understanding the return on equity in your rental properties. So the first two episodes talked about uh, the four ways you make money in real estate and then calculating those returns based off your initial investment at the time of purchase. The second one discussed how to use the spreadsheet. So those two go hand in hand together. If you've not listened to at least the first one on the four ways you make money in real estate, cash flows on everything, I would highly recommend you listen to that before you dive into this episode on return on equity. Because these concepts, or I should say these episodes, build on top of each other. Because return on equity becomes, in my mind, a much better way to analyze your rental properties after you've owned it for a couple of years. Because what happens? You own the property, hopefully the market is appreciating, your tenants are paying down the property. Well, now five, six, seven, eight years down the road, using the initial metric, whether it's your total initial investment or a cap rate, or a GRM, or a cash on cash return when you bought the property years ago is not a great way to go out there and analyze a property now. And that's where return on equity uh, comes into play, and it's a very important concept to understand. So there's uh, the main points we'll discuss in, discuss in this episode are how to calculate and understand return on equity. Then we'll run you through three common scenarios for determining your equity opportunity cost. And I'll give you a quick overview of the equity optimization spreadsheet. And this is one that I built for myself to do some of my own modeling. And then I'm going to plug in a property that I had, so a real world case study, and what I did to analyze the equity in there and to figure out what's the best options, or I should say the best opportunity I have for that trapped equity in there. All right, so before we dive into details on here, um, this is gonna be a meaty topic. So there are three ways you can consume this information. One is listening to this podcast, or you can go out there and watch the recording of this video on YouTube, or you can go out there and read the blog post or do some combination of those three. I think most people are like me, you go out there, you listen to the podcast, and then since this, since this is very numbers driven, you may wanna go see some of these spreadsheets or screenshots I discuss. Go to the show notes, click the link, and there'll be snippets of all the numbers I talk about in there. So if you need to go look at a spreadsheet for a few minutes, click the link, it'll go there, and then you can just scroll down the blog post to get all the details. Okay, so talking about return on investment, versus return on equity. I think this is the best place to start uh, when discussing return on equity. So a quick recap on the return on investment. This is measuring the return on the total amount of money that you're investing in the property when you purchase a property and then calculating that over the first year of returns that you get. So the four ways you make money in real estate, you have cash flow, appreciation, debt pay down, and depreciation. And then your total initial investment is your down payment, loan cost, acquisition cost, and any rent ready cost if you have any. So what you do is you take the total returns, that's the numerator, and then you divide that by your total initial investment and that's the denominator. So it really becomes just a simple fraction to calculate it. So when you take those four ways you make money and those returns, and you divide it by your total initial investment, you get your return on investment or your ROI. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, that is great when you're analyzing a property. Like if you're analyzing a property today or this month to go you know, invest fifty, a hundred thousand dollars on, that's a great way to figure out what you know, what return you'll get on that money to compare it to other investments you could make. But if you fast forward five years down the road, it's not a great way because here's why. That total initial investment, that's a static number. If I buy a property today and then in 2030, 10 years from now, I'm using the total initial investment, my initial investment has stayed the same. So if I spend $50,000 today, well, in 10 years or 20 years, that initial investment is still $50,000. So my denominator is staying static, and it's actually using dollars in earlier years, and now I'm taking returns because every year I can calculate the cash flow, appreciation, debt pay down, 
and depreciation tax benefits I'm getting in the numerator. And when I calculate and divide it out, I'm using today's dollars divided over an initial investment from years ago. And so whether you like the way I calculate ROI or if you use cap rate, cash on cash, or GRM, you run into the same issue because you're really using all the numbers from the time of purchase. And that's just not a great way to go out there and analyze rental properties after you've owned them for a couple of years. And this is where return on equity comes into play. And the best way I can describe it is go back to that math problem or that math fraction I've just discussed a few times now. The top, you got the same four returns, your cash flow, your appreciation, your debt pay down, and your depreciation. Then you divide that by your denominator. And now rather than using your total initial investment, you're simply replacing that with equity. And what is equity? Well, that is you know the initial down payment you put in the property plus any principal reduction that you've gotten from you paying down the loan or hopefully your tenants paying down the loan and also any market appreciation. Or simply put, it's the total value of the property minus your current loan balance on there and the leftover is equity. And so I'm gonna refer to that as ROE for short oftentimes and I'll say ROI or, or I'll say ROI for return on investment. So hear me flip uh, back and forth between those two acronyms ROE for return on equity and ROI for return on investment. So I'll do my best to say it out so that way I don't lose you in there. And from a very conceptual standpoint, uh, the best way I can describe this before I actually go into some numbers here is think about Monopoly. You know, the Monopoly you played as a kid or as an adult. I mean, that was one of my favorite games growing up as a kid. Don't know why, but I just really, really liked it. And you know, the whole goal of Monopoly is you go around the board and you save up money, land on properties, buy a greenhouse, buy a greenhouse, buy a greenhouse, and hopefully you just keep going around the board, you collect some rent from other players there, then you can go up to one property or two green homes, three green homes, four green homes, and then hopefully get a red hotel. And it's a pretty simple game. You go around the board, you collect money, and hopefully the money you collect is more than the money you're paying to other people's rent, and then you just conquer the board, right? Well, return on equity is that same concept where you have a green home, but if you learn how to understand equity and use it correctly, you can actually skip sequentially buying two, three, four green homes and basically go from one green home to a red hotel and almost do a big jump from you know one door to five doors or how many ever doors a red hotel is monopoly we'll say five for simplicity here so you can actually jump from one unit to five or six or seven units or i should say multiple units by learning how to uh, reposition your equity in your properties because every time you have equity in your property there's an opportunity cost in there and the whole concept of return on equity is to calculate, great, what am I getting on that money? And then how can I compare that to other opportunities out there to maximize the return while also balancing with your goals and other investments that you have? Now, as a total side note, as I was writing my notes uh, for this podcast and making that uh, reference to Monopoly, it kind of gave me this weird idea, or not weird idea, it might be weird thinking out, saying it out loud, so I'm curious to hear what people's feedback is, because one of the things I do with one of my buddies um, is I know we see each other, you know, maybe once a year, every other year, just for college buddies, but oftentimes we get around and we, we play Monopoly, but we play with real money. We'll each throw in, you know, $50 or $100 uh, into the kitty, and then we get the, the mon Monopoly money, and that way it makes it interesting. And of course, we drink quite a bit so it makes it even more interesting and a lot of trash talking and debating and it, it, it's a fun time and I was thinking how much I enjoyed that and I miss it because you know college friends are you see each other less and less through the years I was like hmm, that might be a fun like event or night out to do one time around town because if you guys have been to any of my events you know I don't do the typical networking events I like to teach classes um, or I like to meet people one-on-one -on -one. I don't like the general networking events to go out there and just hey let's go grab a beer and hang out for a couple hours I don't find a lot of value out of them uh, personally so that's why I don't host them but I do like to do some fun stuff once in a while so an idea I had and you guys can tell me if this sounds crazy or if it sounds fun it won't hurt my feelings either way. I got thick enough skin. But if actually figuring out one night, we're going to get a bunch of people around 
and we all throw in a few bucks, play Monopoly, have a few drinks, um, you know, just have some fun, BS a little bit. That was an idea I had like a week ago, and I'm curious to hear what people's thoughts are. And I probably should include a survey link or something, but that was too much work. So email me, or if you see me, tell me if you give me a thumbs up or thumbs down on uh, a, you know adult Monopoly with a couple drinks in there. All right, so getting back to a little bit more useful information now. Uh, so going back to return on equity. So I'm going to, I'm actually looking at a spreadsheet right now that I created, and it's a pretty simple one, and I've called it return on equity tables, ROI versus ROE. And I actually just want to show you side-by-side -side comparisons of what the ROI calculation is versus the ROE calculation, so you can kind of start understanding what, how they differentiate and how they work. So give me a second here. I need to go pull up the spreadsheet so I can go in some details here. So again, go to the show notes to see a detailed screenshot of this, or you can also uh, watch the YouTube video to see this scanning as well, but you should be able to follow along uh, with me talking about it. So I've got five columns on the spreadsheet. I actually got six columns. One column is just the year, so I got years one through like 33 listed out. The next column is return on equity. The next column is return on investment. The next column is your total return. And the total return are the four ways you make money in real estate, your cash flow, appreciation, debt pay down, and depreciation, then your equity, and then your initial investment. So your return on equity in that first column is simply the returns from that year divided by the equity that year. And I'm going to read off the next number next to from the ROI or your return on investment, which is your total return from that year divided by your initial investment. And so I plugged in a real property, and this is one we cover all the time on the podcast. It's a three-bedroom, two-bathroom condo in Aurora uh, that rents out for about $1,800, $1,850 a month. And we buy these you know, very frequently because they're one of the better cash-flowing uh cash flow playing deals in Denver. So I plugged in that property and I did round up the round the purchase price to $200,000 just to make it an easy number to talk some numbers here. And then I put in the normal rents, normal expenses. And the two key things you need to know as far as uh, assumptions are I, I'm putting in there a 3% appreciation rate and a 3% rent growth. So I'm being, in my mind, pretty conservative on the numbers I'm putting in there because you'll still see what an impact that has on return on equity. Because the last six years with our crazy appreciation and rent growth, uh, we've seen an amazing equity growth. But I'm going to be a little more conservative here to show you this modeling because it's still important regardless of what type of market you're in over the next five or 10 years. So uh, $200,000 purchase price, Assume the five thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars down payment and about five thousand dollars in total other cost acquisition, loan cost, rent ready cost to give you a total initial investment of fifty five thousand dollars. So some easy numbers here to talk about. So in year one, your return on equity is thirty two percent. Your total return on investment is twenty nine percent because your total return that first year is just under sixteen thousand dollars. Your equity is $50,000, but your total initial investment is $55,000. Why that $5,000 difference? Well, I only put $50,000 down. The other $5,000, I mean, that's basically the cost of doing business in real estate. We have, you know, we are, real estate is not a cheap asset to transact in. There's a lot of transaction costs with real estate compared to the stock market or the bond market. So, and I really think looking at the return equity the first year is really not a good metric because you just bought the property. So I'm gonna give you the return equity, just read it out for the first one to 10 years. So 32%, 28%, 26%, 24%, 22%, that's year five, 21%, 20%, 19%, 18%, and 17% for year 10. Now at year 15, it's 16%. Year 20, it's 14%. Year 25, it's 12%. Year 30, it's 11%. And year 33, once the loan is paid off, we're at 11%. And this is on a 30-year fixed loan, kind of the normal stuff we talk about. All right, so from a high level, what happened there? The percent return on equity is going down every single year. 
Now let's look at return on investment. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to read the first uh, one to 10 years and every five years after that. 29%, 30%, 32%, 33%, 34%. That's year five. Year six, 36, 38, 39, 41, 43 percent. Year 15 is 46 percent. Year 20 is 56 percent. Year 25 is 68 percent. Year 30 is 82 percent. And then once the loan's paid off in year 32, you're at 86 percent. So what happens return on investment? Well, that percent return is going up. Now, that return investment is a very simplistic return because we're just taking in, we're not take, dividing out, uh, you know, taking, taking into account like time value, money, and things like that. But I want to show you that because I want to stress the point as to why using the cap rate or GRM or ROI when you buy the property later down the road is pretty pointless to use after owning the property for a couple of years. Because that whole time I'm reading that, the initial investment stayed static at $55,000. Now, the equity every year is going up um, between market appreciation and my principal reduction. And every year, the return is going up as well. Okay, so from right there, you can see return equity, it goes down as your equity grows, which makes sense because your equity is your denominator. Uh, so your denominator is getting bigger and bigger every year and it's growing faster than the numerator is, which is your cash flow appreciation, debt pay down, and depreciation. So, um, if you're a little bit confused on that, reach out to me, uh, but hopefully conceptually you get the point on there. Oh, actually, you know, before I move on, let me go back to here. Because I used 3% uh, uh, annual appreciation and 3% rent growth. Now, I'm going to plug in here 7% appreciation, and let's plug in here 6% rent growth. You know, kind of numbers we've been seeing the last handful of years here in Denver. Now, I don't think these are sustainable going forward, but I want to show you what an impact this has on ROE and ROI. So reading the first couple of years of ROE, year one's 48%. Year five is 27%. Year 10 is 23%. Year 15 is 16%. Now your ROI, year one is 43%. Year five is 59%. Year 10 is 86%. So the same thing happens here where ROE, your equity is going down, your ROI is going up. Now your return equity, if you can visualize a graph, and I know it's hard to do with the numbers I gave you, but it's going to be with the higher appreciations be a much steeper graph because so many more of your returns are front loaded because what happens if we have a, what, a 7 or 8% appreciation rate? Well, your denominator or your equity is growing a lot faster. So therefore, you're going to have a higher percent return the first few years. Then as your equity grows, your denominator grows and your return, your percent return actually goes down. All right. So let me just put 3%, 3% back in here. So let's screw up our spreadsheet in the future. Okay. So here's a little bit of um, something to wrap your head around. And this is what causes friction. And this took me a while for me to understand as well. Because while your percent of your return on equity is actually going down every year, it's you, you're you actually usually making greater cash flow. So even though your percent return is going down, your cash flow is becoming greater. Why is that? Well, it's because typically your mortgage payment is your biggest expense on any rental property you own. And for a lot of people, they're buying a 30-year fixed mortgage. Even if you're doing an adjustable rate, like an ARM, at a 5- or 7- or 10-year fixed, you still have 5, 7, 10 years, maybe 30 years of fixed payments. So what does that mean? It basically means your payment, your mortgage payment, is inflation-proof. Because what are the other things doing? They're going up. Hopefully, your rent's going up and your expenses are going up. So let's just assume or think your rent goes up at 3% and your expenses go up at 3%. They both go up at inflation. Well, your rent is typically a much bigger number than your expenses or your non-mortgage expenses because on this condo right now, it rents for we see rents between 1800 and 1850 and we see non-mortgage expenses, I think they're right around I want to say around 600 700 a month. Um, give or take a few bucks there. And that's, you know, property management, insurance, uh, repairs, maintenance, all that stuff. So, you know, 1800 at a 3% growth, 
you know, gives you whatever number that is. And then $600 times a 3% growth gives you whatever number that is. But 3% of 1,800 is more than 3% of 600. So if you can visually think about this, your rents are going up and they're actually outpacing your expenses, which is your fixed monthly mortgage payment, plus the expenses on your operating costs for the property. So therefore your spread or your profit margin is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you're getting greater cash flow. So this is what often trips up with people like, oh, well, why would I touch this property when I have greater cash flow? And this is where you need to understand, as I said in that very first episode, cash flow is not everything. So as you hold on the properties and as you build equity, you have what I call equity opportunity cost. And you want to understand and realize how you can utilize your equity and understand, hey, if I use equity for scenario A, scenario B, scenario C, I can go out there and do something else with it versus just getting this increased cash flow every month. So either way, it's a great problem and a great situation to be in. It's what every landlord wants to be in, or at least I want to be in and all my clients want to be in. But I assume it's a great problem to have. I'm making money here, or ooh, I might be able to do some other things over here with my equity and make more money this way. Wonderful problem to have. So it's very much a first world great problem to have. But let's talk about the details about it because this can have a big impact on you building your rental portfolio and getting to your end goal quicker by understanding these equity opportunity costs. So, you know, a very another way to look at this from a conceptual standpoint is I always look at equity. I look at equity as money in my real estate piggy bank. So you know, every month or every year, as your tenant pays your money, you pay your expenses, your equity grows, you're just putting money in your piggy bank. Now, you know, unlike cash flow, you can't, you know, your cash flow, great, it comes in your checking account once a month, you can transfer, do whatever you want with it. Your equity, that's not something you can easily tap into on a monthly basis and say, oh yeah, well, I made $1,000 in equity this last quarter, transfer that to my bank account. Really hard to do. Um, and not very practical to do it in small chunks like that because there's transaction costs and fees and all this other stuff in there. So think about your piggy bank where if you want to extract the equity from there, you generally have to empty the piggy bank or take a hammer to it and break it to get all the equity and cash in there to go utilize it. So if you tap in your equity, it is going to change the performance of your current rental property. And... I'll, actually, I'll just talk more about this as I go through these three scenarios you have with rental properties. Talking numbers will make a lot more sense. So you basically have three main options when you have a current rental property. And these are the, the options you should look at when you want to look at your equity opportunity cost. So option one is to keep it as is and do nothing. It's a good rental property. It's cash flowing. The cash flow is growing every year. Great. Write it out and let the cash flow build. And your equity will keep building as well. Option two, you can do a cash out refinance or a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, to tap into the equity. So the pros there are that you retain ownership of the property, plus you get to pull out that cash. You get to pull out equity as cash to go use for other investments. Number three is sell the property and then use the equity to go out there and buy other rental properties. So what's the best option? Well, it depends on the property, depends on the market, and depends on your goals as to where you are at with the amount of income you want from your real estate portfolio. So I'll kind of discuss all this as we go through uh, these three options. Now, discussing these three options, this is where it gets, I think, really enjoyable and just really fun because we're talking real numbers here and we understand the power of this. It's pretty, it's just mind blowing. Uh, it took me a quite quite some time to really wrap my head around this. And I've explained this, I mean, at least 30 or 40 times this year to clients. And it's always, there's a learning curve to it. So you may need to go back and listen to this section again, or go watch the video or something. But this is the meaty part. And this is where it really, really gets important. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm going to actually plug in some real world numbers because that's what I always like to learn from people and I can give you more accurate numbers that way. So I'm gonna walk you through my own decision-making process with the spreadsheet I built for a property I bought back in 2011. So in 2011, I was not in real estate. I was not an agent. I was not an active real estate investor, I should say, but I always wanted to get into investing. Back then I was running my internet marketing companies and I think I was just starting to 
wind down from my couple year attempt at the day trading the stock market in foreign currencies. Uh, but also at the same time, this was right when the market, uh, the real estate market had bottomed out in many markets. So I bought my very first property, my very first real estate property, because I said, you know what, things are so cheap right now. I travel half the time for fun and for work. I can live there, it can be my home base, a storage unit, and things are so cheap. So I bought a two bedroom, two bathroom condo in Reno, Nevada for $67,000. And yes, I got lucky with the timing because that was about the bottom of the time in the Reno market, like a lot of other markets out here. Now from a very high level, from 2011 to 2019, here are two numbers. When I bought that property, market rents were about $1,000 a month, either $900 or $1,000 a month. I can't remember quite what they were because I was not looking to rent it back then. I bought it as a primary residence. So I was essentially nomading before I knew what nomading was. But I'm gonna say $1,000 for easy math. Uh, and then when I sold it in 2019, the market rent was $1,300 a month. So that is a 30% increase in rents over eight years. Great, I mean, that sounds good. Now, when you look at the appreciation of the, uh, the property value, uh, I bought for $67,000, and that was a foreclosure from Fannie Mae. I bought for $67,000, and at the time I was looking to sell it, uh, I was estimating I could sell it for about $225,000. Well, that's a 235% increase on just the market appreciation. And that's not taking into account the other equity I've built by myself and my tenants paying down the loan on the property. So the punchline here is that the market gifted me with equity. And I know a lot of the listeners out there as well, the market has gifted you with equity the last eight, nine years as well. Because if you bought in Reno or you bought here in Denver, what have prices done? They have gone up. So the market gifted you with equity and you want to analyze that gift and see what the best way to utilize that gift is. All right, so return on equity option number one is to keep it. And so this is diving into my spreadsheet that I'm calling the equity opportunity cost. And so I built this uh, while I was analyzing these O numbers myself. I've used it a few times for other properties and my clients. Uh, so currently the spreadsheet's not available for download. So please don't email me. It may be in the future. I'm not sure what I'll do with it. Uh, but for now, I just use it for myself and with clients because it's a, it's a complicated spreadsheet. So if you're one of my clients or you are a client in the future, we can definitely use a spreadsheet to analyze some properties you have. Otherwise, go to the website. You can see the screenshots here and you can see the numbers and, and run similar scenarios yourself. So option number one is to keep it. And all right, give me a second here so I can pull up the right spreadsheet. So like I said, option number one is to keep the property. Uh, and an important point here is when you're running the numbers on keeping it, you have to use today's numbers. What is today's value? What is today's rent? And what is today's operating cost? Because as I've talked numerous times now, plugging the numbers when I bought this eight, nine years ago is not going to give me the accurate uh accurate picture of my current rental property. So you have to put in numbers today so you have the accurate idea about the pro the performance of the property so you can understand what opportunity cost you have the equity on there. So I actually plugged in the values because now I've sold the property, you know, hint, hint, that's what I did. Um, so I sold this, so I'm actually using uh, actual numbers and they didn't change very much for my estimated numbers, but these are actual the actual numbers for my sales price and what I was using to underwrite the property. So a property address, Reno, Nevada. Uh, I sold it for $229,000. At the time of closing, I had a loan balance of $36,300 left on there. So that gave me an equity of $192,700. 229 minus 36,300. So 192 is my equity. The annual rent, now when I sold it, it was renting at 1,200. Actually, when the tenant moved out, that tenant was leased at $1,200 a month. Now, if I were to re-renew it with a new tenant, market rent was $1,300 a month. So I'm gonna plug in $1,300 a month to give me an annual rental income of $15,600. Because if I did not sell it, I would have kept it and bumped up rents to $1,300 a month. So I assumed 5% vacancy. <coughs> Taxes were about $900 a year. Insurance, it's a condo, is cheap, about $325 a year. I was paying 10% in property management. 
Uh, my HOA was about two fifty-five a month, so right around three thousand dollars for the year. And I used a five percent uh, reserves for repairs and maintenance, so that's about eight hundred dollars for the year. So my total operating expenses for the property uh, was about seventy-four hundred dollars. So fifteen thousand six hundred rents minus seventy-four hundred dollars gives me about eighty-two hundred dollars in net operating income or NOI. Then I subtract out my current mortgage payments, which are about $6,400 for the year. And that left me with a cash flow of $1,837 per year. So an $800 a year cash flow, I mean, hey, I will always take that. If anyone wants to give me $800 a year in cash flow, I will take it. But it's nothing that is going to have a dramatic impact on my life currently or that's having a dramatic impact on my savings rate to go buy more properties. $2,000 a year. While it's nice, it's not having a, it's not moving the needle in a big way to have a big impact on acquiring more properties. So uh, that's the first return, cash flow, $1,800. And then assuming a 3% appreciation, so I'm going back to more conservative stuff, that could be about $6,900 a year in appreciation. My debt pay down, and so this is on a 15-year mortgage, so I was in year you know seven or eight of this mortgage, um, so I was paying down a lot more principal. My principal reduction from that year was about $4,100. My depreciation benefits, once I take the, the, the gross benefits multiplied by my tax bracket, were about $500 a year. So it's a pretty low depreciation because I bought the property for so cheap. So altogether, those four returns adding them up are about $13,300. So if we take that $13,300, divide it by the equity I have in there of $192,000, well, it's going to give me a pretty small return. So it gives me a 6.92% return on equity. Okay, so looking at that, uh, a 6.92% of my money, that's nothing great. I mean, hey, great, I'm happy it's positive. I'm happy it's you know about a 7% return. But if I, if I had that money right now, uh, my inclination is great. I actually might prefer the stock market in some ways because the historical return is, you know, what, 7 8% in the stock market, but I have zero headache with the stock market. Now, of course, I'm comparing kind of apples and oranges on there, but if I'm getting an overall 7% return on my money, 7% in real estate does not make me that excited because I'm like, yeah, I can get sued. I got to deal with hassle. I got to deal with this. Things break. Property managers out of state, they, they're going to eventually go to business. I got to find a new one, yada, yada, yada. There's headaches with there. So I'm getting basically a 7% return on my equity in the property. So another way to look at this is what's the current property analytics if you were to buy it today? So using those numbers of a 229 purchase price divided by those numbers, those operating costs and the rent numbers, gives me a 4.25% cap rate. So a 4.25 cap rate, again, that's nothing exciting. Uh, we can easily beat that here in Denver, and I think that can be beaten in Reno as well. Just this property, the market gifted me equity, um, and that was the return I got in the market. So I would not buy a 4.25 cap rate currently. So the other thing is, well, should I keep this property if it's currently 4.25 cap rate? So these are some items in here that I'm starting to think and analyze, or that I were analyzing and thinking about when I was looking at the property, because a 4.25 cap rate doesn't excite me. $1,800 a year in cash flow doesn't excite me that much. And a roughly 7% return on my money or my equity doesn't excite me that much. Plus, it's out of state, which really doesn't excite me. So I got four bullet points here, and none of them are really getting me excited about this. Again, some of this is just me because I don't like owning out of state properties, if you heard me on other podcasts, and some of it's just the property itself. Plus, I'm still in the accumulation phase of building my rental portfolio. So I need to acquire as many properties as possible, and cash flow is not my main goal. It's acquiring as many properties as possible so I retire in 10 years or 20 years. I can maximize my cash flow then through delayed gratification. And as a side note, if you want to learn those numbers on there, make sure you check out the podcast and the blog post on real estate. Uh, what's it called? Create your real estate investing strategy. And I talk about how to calculate your retirement income there. Uh, and so I'll be referencing some items in here on that podcast as well. Okay, so, oh, here's an interesting side note. I'm looking at my notes here. Interesting side note before I actually move on to option two, because this is this is one of those like mind pretzels here. So I actually bought this condo in Reno in 2011 for $67,000 
but I got it on a 15-year loan, 5% interest rate with 0% down, and actually all the closing costs of the property as well got wrapped into the loan. So I walked, I went to the closing table, and I brought $0 to the closing table, and I got the property. Now, you know, I knew it was a good deal back then, but now since I'm in real estate, now I realize what an amazing deal that was. And I got that because that was through a private lender from a older family, a wealthy friend. And remember at the time here, uh, bonds uh, were just in the tanks, you know, the uh, money markets, you know, what, two years before then, some had went bankrupt and couldn't pay out their 1%, you know, their, their returns or whatever. And so this individual is just looking for areas to basically park her money and outpace inflation. Well, she had known me for years. She trusted me um, and somehow came up that I was buying a property. She said, hey, I will lend you that money at 5%. And she goes, no credit checks, no nothing, no appraisals, just I trust you and then you're living there. So like, you're going to pay me back my money. I was like, great, I'll do that. So if you look at that from an ROI perspective, even though you know I lived there for a while, which is still a cost that you have to spend, um, or at least I do as an adult. I'm not living with my parents anymore, thankfully. Um, so you know that top number. Think about that fraction. That top number, all the returns I was getting, divided by zero. Well, you can't really divide by zero, but that gives you an infinite return. So I'm getting. An, I bought this property, getting me an infinite return. But now I'm getting a 6.9% return equity. So I actually did this calculation months ago. So this number is going to be very rough. Um, but I said, okay, great. I'm going to take that very first month, the next month when I started writing uh, checks. I check for the mortgage balance, a check for the HOA. And I think that was it. Maybe a check for the insurance, whatever it was. So, you know, it's about less than $1,000. It was really, I think it was like maybe $800. It was very, very minimal. So then I took all the returns over the next four years, appreciation, cash flow, depreciation, debt pay down. And if I took those over seven or eight years, divide by that initial investment of $800, I got a 48,000% return on my money. Yes, 48 comma zero, zero, zero. That and an infinite return both sound just absurdly unreal. Um, and that's just where it kind of gets in this mind pretzel. So even though I've got this infinite return on this property, um, now on the equity, I'm making about a 7% return on my equity. So it goes to show, depending on how you look at the property, um, you're going to get different returns. And I want to be as realistic as possible while saying I'm making an infinite return on this property. Sounds really, really cool. Um, I want to actually maximize my bank account and my retirement planning. So I'm going to focus on return equity. And that's, again, why I sold the property. All right. So moving on to option two, which is doing a cash out refinance. All right. Well, I just actually paused the recording for a second. So I paused here for five minutes because as I was just going through this last numbers, I saw a small mistake in my spreadsheet. No, no major impact, but actually I was on the scenario one or the keep it scenario. I actually had, uh, I was calculating the cap rate incorrectly. I was dividing the net operating income over the total equity versus the total purchase price. So for the rest of the episode, uh, the real percentage of the cap rate, uh, which is correct, is about 3.58%. So that's a 3.6 cap rate property that I'll be trading out of in Reno to buy the new property out here in Denver. All right, so now that we have the cap rate uh, sorted out, would not have, a, not have had a big impact on the rest of the numbers, actually no impact. I just noticed it and caught my eye. So I wanted to correct that. Uh, hence, that's another reason why I'm not sharing the spreadsheet yet because I still got a few bugs to work out. All right, so we are looking at option two now, um, which is a cash out refinance. Now, as I mentioned, you've got two main ways to extract equity from a property. You can do a HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit, or a cash out refinance. So HELOCs are a great tool to use if it's a short term loan or you've got a short term payback period. So if you want to extract equity to go fund some fund the fix and flip or to go out there and buy a Burr property, buy rehab rent, uh, refinance, repeat property, um, a HELOC can be great, assuming you'll be paying back within, I'd say about one to two years, so a very short payback period. Well, I'm not doing flips, as you guys know. I want to go out there and buy more rental properties. So I went with a cash out refinance 
to extend my payback period for as long as possible. So that way, basically, my other properties could pay back uh, the cash out refinance on here. So when it comes out to uh, doing a maximum cash out refinance on a rental property, uh, it's generally limited to limited to 75% loan to value. If that says, hey, the total value of the property is this, we'll give you up to 75% loan. So $100,000 property, they'll loan you $75,000, assuming you and the property check out. So I plugged in 75% LTV on the spreadsheet, and I've got a 4.75% interest rate over a 30-year mortgage. Now, if I do that with the property in Reno, Nevada, it gives me new loan amount of about $172,000 minus my existing loan, because you got to pay off of that loan, get a new loan in place, about $36,000, then minus about $3,500 in closing costs and maybe buying a point buy down. I just assumed a 2% uh, refinance closing cost. So two points is equal to 2% of the overall uh, new loan you have. So subtracting all that out, that would leave me with about $132,000 in cash that I could pull out of the property. Now we have to go back and relook at the property performance now, uh, the one in Reno, Nevada, because since I have a new loan amount and a higher monthly payment, I have to see how that property performs. So the rent's the same, about 15600 for the year. The operating expenses is the same, about $8,200 for the year. That leaves me with a net operating income of $7,405. That stays the same as it did previously. But my new mortgage payment is about 10600 for the year. Well, 10600 subtracted from $7,400 <clears throat> is a negative $3,200 a year in cash flow. Ooh, okay. So I'm pulling out about one hundred and thirty-two thousand dollars, but I have a negative thirty-two hundred dollars a year in cash flow. Hmm. Pro is I get some cash. Con is I have a negative cash flowing asset right now. But let's look at the four ways to make money in real estate. So I'm negative cash flowing thirty-two hundred dollars a year. Appreciation stays the same, about sixty-nine hundred dollars a year. My debt pay down, which is my principal reduction actually reduces to about $2,700 for that year, because this is going to be that first year of a 30-year mortgage, which is mostly interest payments, not principal reduction. And my depreciation stays the same, about $500 a year. So I get an overall return of about $6,900 that year, which gives me a 12% return on equity, which is actually almost double what I was getting previously, but now this is a native cash flowing property. Well, the reason is because go back to that simple math problem. And this is why you can't just go off of one metric, you know, blindfolded and just go off of that one thing. Well, because I have a smaller equity number, so a smaller denominator, and it's just looking at the four returns in real estate. So I've got a smaller denominator. Um, so it's giving me a higher percent return on my equity. Now, if you're looking at the video or looking at the blog post, you'll see a red box on there called debt coverage ratio. And it's red, meaning bad, as in like, you know, red stop. And it's at a 70% uh, debt coverage ratio. All right, so what is debt coverage ratio? Uh, that is actually a commercial lending term, or I should say a commercial lending underwriting guideline a lot of banks use to underwrite properties when it's more about not you as a borrower, but you as the or you, the asset you're buying, and they make sure that the asset is a, a good investment for them to make in terms of the loan. So you'll hear it called debt coverage ratio or debt service coverage ratio, so DCR or DSCR. I tend to call it DCR just to because it's shorter and simpler. Um, now, this does not actually use to calculate if I were to get a, a cash out refinance loan, and probably for most of you, if you're doing like a four unit or less loan, but it's a good way to measure the, the performance of the property to see if it's going to be a safe investment uh, going into like a downturn or with those margins of errors built in there that banks use. So the way you, ca you calculate DCR is pretty simple. You take the NOI or the net operating income and you divide that by your annual debt service. And it's just your principal and interest 
not your taxes and insurance because that's already calculated in the operating expenses. So it's your NOI divided by your annual debt service. And the general rule of thumb that lenders want to see is 125% debt coverage ratio, which basically means that for every dollar of debt you have, they want to see a dollar twenty-five in net operating income. So it's a twenty-five cents or twenty-five percent uh, margin between your operating income and the debt coverage rate, and then your annual debt coverage or your debt service, because that gives plenty of wiggle room on there in case you know the economy goes south or something bad happens to the property. Like, hey, the property or the income from the property can safely cover the property's operating expenses plus safely cover the, the uh, monthly and annual debt payments that we have. So we'll rule on that. So I like to look at that guideline as well, uh, because you know if we just look at the percent and returns over returns, it can be positive, but this helps us to make sure that we are keeping all of our assets uh, safe and safe margins. So that way, uh, if something does bad and something bad happens, whether it's to you, your job or the market, you've got some wiggle room in there. All right, so I get to walk away with 132,000, but I'm negative cash flow about $3,200 a year. Not great. All right, so let's move on to option 2B, which is not doing the maximum uh, refinance, but it's actually doing a safe cash out refinance. And by safe, I mean figuring out the amount of money that I can borrow that but allows me to stay within 125% or greater of that debt coverage ratio. And so that magic number is a 41% loan to value. So just, you know, everything else is staying the same, the same interest rate of 4.75, the same loan terms of 30 years, the same property performance of rents and operating expenses all stays the same. But I'm saying, how much money can I borrow against the property to go out there and still keep the property safely performing, ridding to this general rule of thumb of 125% debt coverage ratio? So that number is 41% loan to value. Um, <clears throat> so that means, so two ways to look at this when you do a cash out refinance is just not the property performance, but also reverse it as like you're rebuying the property. Now in that first scenario of two way of a max cash out refinance, I don't know many people, and I'm definitely one of these people where I would put 25% down and have a negative cash flowing property. That's not my idea of an investment. Now, if I'm nomading or house hacking with a minimal down payment, different story. But if I'm putting down 25%, I want the property to be a, a cash flow performing property. Um, same thing here. Now, oh great, I like this property, but am I going to put down a 40, no, that's a 59% down payment. Or am I going to put a 59% down payment on a property? To keep to make it a, a cash flow positive property, I'm certainly not going to because I'd rather put down 20 or 25 percent per property to maximize the amount of properties I'm accumulating for myself to build up my rental portfolio. But let's run through these numbers here. So that's one thing I don't like about this: it's a very very low loan to value ratio, but it can be. A, it still is a good safe option. So my total new loan new loan amount was about ninety four thousand dollars. Subtracting out the current loan, two uh, percent for the loan cost, and that's going to give me a cash out of about fifty-six thousand dollars. So same thing. I got my rent. I got my annual operating data, um, and then I've got my net operating income. So I've got my net operating income of about seventy-four hundred dollars minus my annual mortgage payments. Gives me a cash flow of about sixteen hundred dollars a year. All right, well that's a positive cash flow and a debt coverage ratio of one hundred and twenty-seven percent. So that way it's going to be a performing property that if something happens in the economy, it should still pay for itself. So taking the cash flow and then the annual, the total returns, I'll be making about ten thousand five hundred per year. So now that puts me about a seven point seven five percent return equity. So a little bit better than what I was getting, keeping it as is at about a 6.9%, um, but a 7.75%, nothing great. But now I've got $55,000 to go out there and buy a new property with. Okay, so let's move on to option number three, which is to sell the property. And this is going to be the simplest calculation here in the spreadsheet. And this is actually the real numbers from when I sold the property. So $229,000 was the sales price minus the loan payoff about $36,000, 
minus the selling cost of paying the real estate commissions, the real estate, uh, you know, standard closing costs, about $500 for inspection. And then the buyer uh, did use a VA loan. And with VA loans, you got to wrap in the closing costs in the loan. So I actually listed the property at 225 I didn't. My agent in Reno listed the property for 225, but they offered us 229, so we gave them a four thousand dollars seller credit back to cover the closing cost. So the selling cost a little bit high. That's why uh, the selling costs are just under nineteen thousand dollars. So that gives me a cash proceeds of a hundred, about a, approximately one hundred and seventy-four thousand um, dollars. So pros to here, I've got a lot more money coming out. Con is I'm selling an asset that's no longer going to be bringing me bringing me in a monthly amount of cash flow. So what's the best option to do? Well, you really got to compare the three options, I guess in this case, the four options to see what the best option is and then weigh it with your with what's going on in your own life, your goals, and all this other stuff. So let's do that. Oh, actually, before we do, uh, a, an important note to make is that if you do a cash out refinance on investment property, it is not a taxable event. You owe zero taxes on a cash out refinance. If you sell the property, you may owe you may owe capital gains. So make sure you talk to your uh, CPA about that to figure it out. Now, in this case, even though I did live in this property for a couple of years, that was a long time ago. So I would pay capital gains on there. And since I got such a great amount of equity, it would be a good chunk of capital gains. So I did what most real estate investors did, and I utilized a 1031 exchange, which is just part of the tax code that allows you to defer your capital gains taxes down the road to maximize the amount of cash you have to invest today. If you want the details on that, there's a podcast we did a while ago on 1031 exchanges. It's a detailed one. Go listen to it. Just understand it's a way to defer capital gains. All right, so let's look at the summary tab I have on the spreadsheet. And I've got four main sections on here. So I'll just go by each section and describe it to you and then give you the final numbers at the end for comparison. So the first section is the new rental assumption inputs. And this is <clears throat> the way I'm going to use to calculate what type of rental property I can buy. Uh, from the equity proceeds from those various scenarios. Because since I've got different numbers for each, it's very hard to say, oh, let me go find a property where I can go spend 30000 100000 174000 on here. Rather, I'm going to do some just you know higher level math to give us an idea of the return. So I'm putting a 6% cap rate for Denver, and we can buy properties with a higher cap rate and a lower cap rate, but I use 6% because I feel like that's a pretty uh, conservative number and one that can be easily found in Denver. I'm assuming a 25% down payment, a 4.75% interest rate, 30-year uh, mortgage, a 3% annual appreciation rate, a 25% tax bracket, and then also to calculate uh, tax benefits, I put in there 85% of the purchase price is the improved structure. As I mentioned in that uh, first episode on this course, uh, you know when you buy a property, you have the land plus the improvement, which is a structure. And generally speaking, Denver were about an 85% improvement in a lot of places. And the fourplex I bought was actually within like one or 2% of that. So it was actually really, really close. So those rental assumptions are going to be used across all those different scenarios to see what type of income and what type of return, I should say, I can make from the new rental property I buy. So the next section is just summarizing the returns on the current rental property across these four scenarios. So the first one is if I keep it. I'll be making about 1800 and change a year in cash flow, and my total return will be about 13000 for the year. If I do a maximum cash out refinance, it'll be a negative $3,200 a year cash flow with a total return of about $6,800 uh, on the four ways you make money, but I'll have $132,000 from equity to go out there and buy a new property here in Denver. Or if I do a 2B, a safe refinance, uh, which is that lower loan to value, I'd be about $1,600 a year in cash flow and be making about $10,500 in total return on that property and about $56,000 to go out there to buy a property here in Denver. Option three or scenario three of sell it is going to be zeros on the current rental because I will no longer have that asset, but I'll have $174,000 in equity or in cash, I should say, cash from the equity to go out there and buy a new rental property. And so here's an important 
point to understand is that the cash we're pulling out, whether it's from the refinance or selling the property, that's what's being used as the down payment on the new property in these calculations. And also from a return uh, standpoint, we're basically taking, this is how we go from a, a return on equity uh, measurement to a return on investment measurement, because we're taking that equity and now we're moving it to a new property and we can calculate ROI that way and start this cycle all over again. So the new rental property, um, the way I did this math is I just took out the um, you know cash of cash from equity, the amount of money I can walk away with, dividing that by 25%, and that will give me the final purchase price. And then when I used to calculate the rents and everything, I just took the purchase price, multiply it by the cap rate to give me a net operating income. And that way I can kind of get a very high level ballpark as to what type of return and cash flow I can expect from the proceeds I have. So scenario one of keeping the current rental, well, that's all zeros in a new rental because I'm not buying a new rental. I have no cash to go buy a new rental. Scenario two, the maximum cash out refi, I can go buy about $530,000 worth of a properties. And so that'll give me a cash flow of about 7,200 and a total return, including cash flow about 33,000 that first year. So I'll be getting a $33,000 ROI on um, my investment. Scenario 2B, the safer cash out refinance. I've only got about $56,000 to invest, so I can go out there and buy a $223,000 property, uh, and that will give me about $3,000 a year in cash flow and about a $14,000 a year overall return. And the final option of selling it and then 1031 in the, one, 1031 in the money, I can go out there and buy about a $700,000 property. I'll be making about $9,500 in cash flow, and I'll get a total return of just under $44,000 a year. So about those three options, the sell it is the best option. But it's not really a fair comparison because I need to compare what's it like ha keeping my current rental plus the returns from the new rental and seeing which one gives me the best combined returns of the both. Uh, and actually, before I move on to that, I just scrolled down and saw this other row I put in there, which is return on investment. And this is where I'm taking that equity extraction and it's being used as a down payment on the new property. All three of those scenarios, 2A, 2B, and 3, so max out refi, safe refi, and sell it, they are giving me a 25.24% return on investment across all three. And reality will be like that, no, but just the way I use to do that high level calculation, they're all gonna give me the exact same percent return because the assumptions are the same. Again, this is meant to give me and give you a high level overview to see what the equity opportunity costs you have are. All right, so returns on both properties. So this is taking the current property in Reno and then adding it to my replacement or the new property out here in uh, Denver. So option one of keeping it, it's going to be just the returns of that first property, 1800 in cash flow and about 13300 in the cumulative return. And when I say cumulative return, that's the four ways you make money in real estate. So it's including that cash flow number. I just want to give you both numbers on there. So option 2A, the max cash out refi, is just under $4,000 a year in cash flow because Reno is a negative cash flowing number or property. The one in Denver is a positive cash flowing property. And I'll give me about a $40,000 a year return uh, using all four return metrics. The safe refi will give me about $4,600 a year in cash flow and a just under $25,000 total return. The sell it option uh, is going to give me about $9,500 in cash flow and about $44,000 in a total return across all four metrics. So which one gives me the best cash flow and the biggest total return? Well, it's by it's selling it and buying a new property is giving me the absolute best cash flow and the absolute best return. So in my mind, that was the winner, and that's what I went with. Um, so, and this was just kind of like the high level scenario. So let me give you the real numbers of what I purchased with, and we'll talk a little bit more about this and wrap things up. Um, so now I'm looking at the return on investment quadrant. Uh, on the fourplex I bought, so I bought for $850,000 in Westminster, and I put 25% down. So I needed more than $174,000 in down payment and closing cost stuff. So I brought in some outside money, but the vast majority of it uh, was from my sales proceeds in the Reno condo. 
So with that, I'm going to be making about $12,200 a year in cash flow. It's about $1,000 a month. And my overall return is just over $60,000 the first year. We look at appreciation, depreciation, and debt pay down. And my return on investment percent return is a 28% uh, return on my money there. So a little bit higher than I calculated, which I'm fine with. And part of that, too, is those, the raw dollar numbers is because I, I, I brought an outside money to get the deal done. And I think I estimated what a 25% return. And I got a 28% return. Now, if that had gone the other way from you know 25 estimated to a 23 or 22% estimated, I'm not going to really care either way because it's still way, way greater than the current return I was getting in the uh, property in Reno, Nevada. All right, so a couple of key takeaways here that I think is very important to understand. So taking a step back from all these numbers and going to high-level understanding of it. Um, so there, in my mind, two key principles for why I'm getting such a greater return here. One is I'm re-leveraging up. So when I sold that property in Nevada, uh, I was at about a 16% loan to value uh, if I, you know, at my current, my original loan on there. Now this new fourplex, I'm at a 75% loan to value. So as we discussed in the first episode, you know, that gives me a smaller new denominator, so therefore greater return. As you've heard this saying numerous times before, leveraged real estate is key to making greater returns out there. So the more you leverage up, the more money you can make. But keep in mind, uh, you know, it cuts both ways. And if the market turns, it, you can, you know, it hurts you more as well. But more leverage, the greater return you'll get. So I re-leveraged up. Uh, the second thing is I bought a better rental property. I went from like a 3.6% cap rate in Reno to a 6% cap rate out here in Denver. Now, if I went from a 3.6 cap rate in Reno and then bought a 3% cap rate in San Francisco, well, I would probably not be making more money because I went down to a lower cap rate. I'm buying a worse rental property from a cash flow perspective. So I bought a better rental property um, and therefore I'm getting a better return. So like if you go in here, and I'm going to go in here and change my market cap rate assumption in Denver from 6 to 7%. And what that does to my returns here on the sell it is now I'm going to be making $16,000 a year in cash flow and $50,000 in total returns on this option three to sell it, which is what I did because I'm buying an even better cash flowing property. So you have to look into that as well as to, you know, why that's performing better. But those are the two main high level principles. You are re-leveraging up. And then you're you're putting the capital to a better rental property. You do those two things. Uh, from every scenario I run, you make more cash flow, you make more money um, than you would otherwise. I've yet to run a scenario. If there is one, I would love to know because I have looked at this for about 12 ways from Sunday or whatever that saying is. Um, so let's see here. Uh, okay, to wrap up some conclusion on here, um, what's the highest and best use of equity in your rental properties? Well. The best answer is it really depends. It depends on the property, depends on the market, depends on what you can trade into, and it depends on your goals. Now, for me, this was a very black and white, easy decision to make, and I already knew the decision before I built the spreadsheet and ran the numbers through there. It's because I'm in the accumulation phase of my building my rental portfolio, and I understand the re-leveraging up concept. So I wanted to take that equity and go out there and buy more property because I need more rentals to hit my end retirement goal in cash flow and net worth. So I just want to get as many properties as possible. And by selling and walking with $175,000, it's a lot quicker for me to get the money that way than saving $1,800 a year in cash flow plus my personal savings rate. Plus, I'm not a fan of out-of-state investing. I wanted to move my money from Reno to Denver um, just because that fits my personality and my investing goals better. Now, if you're nearing retirement, then keeping the property and paying it off may be the best option for you. If you've got your 10 properties and a couple have paid off and you still got you know five, six left to pay off, um, and you only need six or seven paid off, you might say, great, I'm good with this. It's just icing on the cake. Man, I don't want to deal with this. Cool, pay it off. Or it might be one of those situations where you look at it, and that's because you're in the debt payoff phase of your uh, in, uh, investing uh, strategy right now. The other option might be, you know what? This is a really poor performing rental property of a 3.6 cap rate. I'm going to sell it and then use the proceeds to pay off four of my other rental properties 
That way I can uh, realize more cash flow today. Um, even though you're selling one asset, creates more cash flow today, and therefore I can retire sooner because you know what? I've got 10 properties. I only need really seven. So I'm going to sell this one that's just, man, you know, the market gave me the gift of equity. It's a, you know, it's not a great rental property. I'm going to sell it, take it off and pay off the rest. That way I can retire three years earlier. And so this is where you have to really start looking at all these different things, not just the property, not just what you bought it for, but what your goals are, what your plans are, what phase you're in, in your real estate investing strategy. And uh, I haven't published it yet, but I just recorded an episode called Create Your Real Estate Investing Strategy. And I go through the four phases of your real estate investing strategy in there. And I do discuss ways to calculate and determine your retirement income and how to track, uh, you know, say, hey, I want $10,000 in retirement from real estate. You try to backtrack to how much rental properties you need to buy today to get the end goal. So that episode, if you've not listened to it, will help you kind of wrap your head around it. So what my plan is, what I do is every year, I'll put all my rental properties into a spreadsheet to calculate the return on equity and just give me a snapshot of what I'm doing out here. It's kind of the equivalent of going out there and rebalancing your stock and bond portfolio to make sure that you're in the right uh, you know, balance of aggressiveness, you know, stocks versus bonds, international versus domestic, things like that. So I'd advise everyone out there to do the same. If there's a better way to do it or you do something else, I would love to know because um, I, you know, I definitely don't have this figured out. 100% guaranteed. I don't think anyone does. So I always love debating and talking about this and learning from peers around around town. Um, so that's actually one of my current projects is I've got a tracker built for myself, but I want to actually um, get all the kinks worked out, make it a lot more user friendly and actually share it with clients. Uh, that way they can track it on there and give them a quicker idea about where they're at with their in terms of their goals and then give them that high level overview as far as like return on equity. Um, and so once I get that released, I'll definitely be sharing it with my clients. And the plan there is, you know, once a year. We can meet, look at the numbers, look at your current situation, and make sure that you're on track for hitting your retirement goals. And this is where this is what I, one of the things I really love is more of that like the longer term real estate financial planning stuff. I, it's so much fun to do in my mind. So it's getting down to actually do some planning like that. All right, guys. So that wraps up uh, this episode. Um, definitely keep your eyes out for future episodes talking about the future spreadsheet I just mentioned. Uh, I'll definitely teach, be teaching classes on there. Um, webinars, podcasts, will that spreadsheet be public? I don't know at this point, just depends. In six months, I might know. So keep your eyes on the email list, the website, or always feel free to email me and ask them. I'll be more than happy to tell you. Um, and if you have current rental properties out there or need help analyzing properties, reach out to me. Um, that's one of the things I do. I'm always happy to do like a free investment consultation with people out there to help you kind of do the game plan and say, great, here's you know the monopoly pieces you have. Let's figure out other ways to manipulate it and get you closer to that end goal of, hey, you got three green houses. Hey, let's get you two red hotels and you know speed up you going around the board, you know, things like that. So I love doing that. There's uh, email me or there's a link on the website or the show notes to go set up a free investment consultation with me. And yeah, so this is the third episode in our investment property analysis course. Uh, and the goal of this was to get you understanding the concept of return equity and then using a real world example in a rental property to actually understand how it applies. The next three episodes are going to be looking at equity from your primary residence. Uh, so the next two episodes are, man, they, they go hand in hand because actually a, a real estate financial planning software model I built for a client. And it's what many of you guys have experienced. They bought their property, their primary residence, I think three, four years ago. So they've seen some really good appreciation. They're sitting on equity. But like me and a lot of people, they need to acquire more rental properties to hit their end goal for uh, real estate retirement cash flow. So I ran through the model of, hey, should you keep it as a rental? Do you stay there? Do you HELOC, cash refi, sell it? Kind of all the same stuff, just under the primary residence. So we do two episodes on that. And the third one is just something I did recently, which is I just did a cash out refinance on my primary residence to go out there and buy more rental properties. And on there, I'll just kind of give you some quick numbers on why I did it and what I expect with that money and how far it can move me towards my goal. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. I love doing these. You got questions, feedbacks, other ways you analyze properties, reach out. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next episode.